Welcome back to the Zeitcast, friends, where we explore intersections of theology and culture. I am so thrilled, and I was just telling the Reverend Benjamin Kramer. Uh, ben, do you go by Ben or Benjamin? What's Either one is great. Comfortable? I usually just don't like okay. Benji, so. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I feel like, you know, um, we've been connected from afar for a long time and uh, read so many things that have encouraged me and inspired me. And I was just saying how much I feel spoiled right now to be able to have conversations like this that really feel like they're as much for my own therapy and sanity yeah. as anything. So, yeah. <laughs> so, but, but what, so what a gift to be able to have this conversation. I know that you, like me, have spent most of your life in evangelical spaces, uh, but also your own experiences of of church hurt. And what I, I love, and maybe this is a good place to jump in because there's so many things I want to talk about in terms of what you do, but I like you being the product of a holiness tradition. Mm -hmm. So um, church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee is my background. So like super Pentecostal, but in the Methodist church now, like most recently. Um, but I'm always interested when those of us that come from more like of a, of a holiness context, find ourselves in the intersections we are now because I'm okay. So two things that I, that I really resonate with uh, uh, Ben one, I also feel like I sort of stumbled into some weird form of digital pastoring. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that's what I was doing. <laughs> I remember years ago, like getting introduced in his event as like the, the Twitter pastor, um, which this was before like Twitter, of course, became the fun house of pathologies that it yeah. is <laughs> right now. That's a good description. <laughs> It was like, and, and you know, and there there was a season then too. I felt like I, I I wasn't supposed to lean to that as much, but this sense of just by putting some things out there, you yeah. find other folks who maybe feel like they're on the margins of their own communities, and yeah. and it becomes a source, hopefully, of of comfort. Yeah. But I I'm guessing that you like me never intended to spend as much time talking about politics and theology as you are, and I'm wondering <laughs> how a good holiness Wesleyan boy like you finds yourself in a place like this? <laughs> Gosh, that's an excellent question. I, I think I described it uh, to folks sometimes it's like going full circle. So I wasn't in the holiness movement yeah. my whole life. I came later as a senior in high school. Um, my mom is the uh, granddaughter uh, and great granddaughter of Nazarene pastors. Uh, but I had hadn't okay. grown up in the movement. We were we were in a very nationalistic um, sect of Christianity in mm. Idaho, homeschooled K through 12, just as, as rural and as nationalistic as you can really imagine and very far right on the spectrum. So politics was so much a part of my theology then, um, but in a very different mm. way than it is now. Right. And so going through the Wesleyan uh, holiness tradition, uh, theological training and all these things, like uh, being apolitical or politically moderate is kind of the virtue uh, within that movement, yeah. right? And in in times of neutrality sure. and things like that, it that's a, that's a great way to bring people to the table and things like that. But as I continued to study Wesleyanism and Bonhoeffer is a huge influence on my life, so so is Kierkegaard mm -hmm. and uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Some pivotal figures that were very uh spoken critique of the christendom of their time uh when i read yeah. these figures and especially the prophets of the bible who held the kings accountable to the covenant of god um yeah. i i continued yeah. to see the movement that i was raised in seem to start becoming mm. mainstream Right. And so I not only yeah. had a personal experience of this, but the the figures I was reading and the scripture that I was reading continued to call me to say, hey, we really need to engage this conversation. And it's not a matter of partisanship. Mm. It is a matter of right. God's people really giving over into a, a form of political extremism that is shaping their yeah. integrity and reputation in our culture more than the gospel of Jesus. And that is when yeah. the prophets need to start speaking louder, right? Um, mm. So that's, it kind of came full circle for me uh, as far as my upbringing and, and where I feel like I've arrived right now. But yes, I did not expect at all mm. to do this online, mm. let alone uh, speak into the the issues that I feel like we've been called to speak into today. It's so interesting too because uh, again, I don't want to I don't want to project too much of my life and story onto yours, but I'm guessing that when you get pushed back, and I imagine that you do get pushed back, 
that the kind of pushback that you get is the kind of pushback that I get where it's kind of like, oh yeah, like uh, now what are you, some sort of democratic party yeah. operative or some version of like giving in to peer pressure or cultural pressure, which I always find hilarious because uh, no, there was all the incentive in the world to not talk like this about the kinds of things that we talk about now. And and beyond that, that sense too, that it was it was absolutely from going deeper into my own tradition <laughs> and these theological resources that meant the most to me yeah. that put me out here in the way that I am now. Yeah. Is that the kind of pushback that you get though? Is that what folks say? Yeah. It's like, this is some sort of selling out. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, it's obvious that you get that same kind of pushback too, because that's the exact line that, that I will, that I'll get like just quick jabbing messages. Like how much is the, the democratic party paying you to, to be online or whatever. Right. And I'm just like, if you look at the sheer numbers, like theological conservative platforms are getting paid exorbitant amounts of money and I'm paying for Absolutely. my newsletter, uh, platform out of my own pocket. <laughs> you know? So like yeah. if, if I was yeah. doing this to make money, I chose the wrong side to, to make, to make yeah. it a lucrative career. Like uh, Charlie Kirk, for example, is making millions of dollars. Mm. Right. And he invokes scripture right. and Christianity all the time. And so it, like, if we yeah. were looking for it to be a, a lucrative career, be paid by organizations, then gosh, we chose the, the wrong track. But uh, so I try to let them like, just encourage them to go look at just the sheer data or the numbers, which they, they never yeah. do. But like, to to yeah. to have the audacity of like you're doing this because of a current trend it it right. minimizes all of the diligent study we've done the the experiences yeah. we've had the our pastoral i mean yeah. just like you I, i've had 20 plus years of, of full-time pastoral ministry from youth group mm -hmm. to young adult to a lead pastor of a church like and in a place like ruby red idaho as well like this sure. <laughs> th those are all kind of downplayed when we're just kind of written off as if we're on the quote other side Rather than thinking, yeah. how how do we need to listen to those who are trying to hold the powers that be accountable? Yes, yes. And that's one of the things I love about what you do, the way that you do it, the kind of sound that you have. It is it is very it is very pastoral. Um, I do think what we desperately need right now is pastoral theologians mm -hmm. who are able to speak to the moment out of a place of sincere care for the church, but also <laughs> not afraid to confront these kind of principalities yeah. and and, and powers. Yeah, I think though, like when you mentioned even like uh, data, I don't know if that's a thing anymore. <laughs> I was like, data yeah. and research is not. Because <laughs> gosh, if you're studying it's, the data, it, it really feels like you're living in a different universe. You know, it does. Like, and that's really where it I'm does. drawn is looking at the data of issues, yeah. policy, like all yeah. of those things. Yeah. But then you get in a conversation with a normal person online and it feels like, where are you getting right your your perspective from and it's brought up the need right. for like we need spiritual formation revival in in the church of just yeah. how do we Ooh. approach truth and what it feels like like what does truth feel like when you're reading it like ap yeah. appropriate yeah. data to inform the moment yeah say that i mean it's so like uh i had zeke hernandez on wonderful professor last week who wrote the book um uh, the truth about immigration. And I was oh, so aware from wow. feedback I was getting. People hear him. And of course, it sounds like he and we in that conversation that we're in the in the twilight zone right. because it's so meticulously researched and data driven. Yeah. And so then people are like, well, I don't know. I've never heard anything like this before. I guess you've not because yeah. you've decided how you what you think about this based on a handful of memes. Yeah. So. It, no, because <laughs> that's what the recycled as pe someone who gets the like, if you just put all of the feedback I get just in DMs, it's it's the yeah. same line, same rhetoric. And it's, that's right, what's scary right. to me is like, it's not just one person saying yeah. something that's off kilter. The narrative has been hijacked that isn't deep, right. but it's full of fear. Right. And like, I grew up in yeah. Idaho and people yeah. wouldn't think this, like we're near Oregon and Washington, but we had the highest number of, of immigrants, uh, from, all over the world in, you know, 2013, 2012, um, we were a re mm. re refugee resettlement, but we also get a lot of immigrants from Mexico. And so like, I've spent my whole life around 
immigrants and they pay millions of dollars in taxes every single year. Our yeah. agricultural, our yeah. dairy industry, our hospitality industry would literally crumble without immigrants, both mm. undocumented and documented. Um, yeah. It would just fall apart. So like, I keep thinking like, you think inflation is bad now? Like what mm. would happen if all of the people who picked our food and packed our, our packages and That's right. milked our cows and picked our produce, like what would happen if they were all just gone tomorrow? Um, yeah. And so like that it's, it's, that is a tangible way of loving your neighbor. And in my, in my opinion is to yes, know the accurate yes. data because I have to love my neighbor with my mind too. And if my mind is filled right. with beliefs that dehumanize them, mm -hmm. that make me fear mm -hmm. them, like that's not loving my neighbor in my mind. And what does Paul say? Yeah. Oh, let the, you will be renewed by the renewing of your mind. Right. And, and mm. that's part of loving mm. your neighbor too. So it's, it's, it's heartbreaking mm. when I get that, constant narrative that seems to just justify one thing, which is to not love other yeah. people who are not like us. That's it. And you know, I don't think that's an oversimplification. That's what it feels yeah. like that. It's like a whole apologetic for why I don't have to love all yeah. of my neighbors. Why I don't have to see all of my neighbors as neighbors. Yeah. Uh, the demonization of immigrants. I mean, yeah, Zeke uh, that I mentioned Hernandez, you know, his book talks about how uh, the number he, he has is that, the average immigrant, again, um, legal, undocumented, whatever, averages to like two hundred and ninety thousand dollars per person in public coffers over the course Man. of their lifetime. I mean, it's just so. Um, Man, I do want to really jump in, in uh, um, up the deep end with you, though, because I feel like a lot of what I have been doing is, and I think that's, I hope that's helpful, responsible. You know, thirty thousand foot, contextualize the thing. I do love and appreciate when people are giving responsible hot takes. I feel like that's uh, that's so helpful. So I would love to like dive into right right into some 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 topical business. Yeah, uh, Ben, what do you have to say? So you you've talked a little bit about this whole King David thing. <laughs> I need I need you to talk about the King David thing. Oh, like man. talk us off talk us off the ledge <laughs> with King David. <laughs> Man, there's so much to say. I I wrote a post about it, which you probably saw, and I feel like I went through several revisions because it was just too long. Like I was just, mm. you know, preacher. You know, your our our job hazard is to sure. just keep speaking, right? But gosh, there's right. so much there. So maybe I'll just do a couple of of bullet points. I I think when in Western American Christianity we tend to elevate Kings when we're reading the Bible and yes. to the neglect and ignorance of the prophets. I would tell yeah. my congregation quite often. I'm just like, okay, besides the, some of the Psalms, you know, 73 of the Psalms are attributed to David, but during the time they would mm -hmm. write the Psalms, they would put whoever was in authority on the Psalm. So mm. it doesn't necessarily mean it was authored. Some were authored by David, but that sure. doesn't mean that all 73 of the 150 Psalms were written by him. So besides the Psalms and the songs of Solomon, how many books of the Bible do you have named after specific Kings? Mm. Zero. <laughs> yeah, and how yeah. many how many how many books do we have named after specific prophets we have we mm. have so many we have 12 right wow we have the the major and minor prophets the, and they the yeah. bible cares more about what the prophets had to say <laughs> and, and like that yes, is the, yes. the key and jesus quotes the prophets the most and critiques the kings mm. like calls Herod a fox. Mm -hmm. He calls out Caesar, like right. call, critiques Solomon. The lilies of the field are clothed in more splendor than who? Solomon. Like yeah. it's a critique to the, his elaborate yeah. wealth and the way that he used power. Right. right. And so we tend right. to elevate kings and ignore prophets. And so we tend to ignore when the demand for a king happened in the first place, which first Samuel eight, mm. you see this demand for a king take place. And God says to Samuel, this is what's going to happen. If they have a king instead of me, um, tell them, tell them the urgent situation that they'll be in if they demand a king. And after even hearing the detailed warning from Samuel, Israel still demanded for a king instead of following God as yeah. the as their king um, broke God's heart, but God is faithful to God's people. And 
my New Testament professor would often say a form of God's wrath in the Bible is often turning people over to their own desires. Yeah. Right? Because God yeah. gave humanity free will. So they demanded a king, mm-hmm. then I will warn you, but I will walk alongside you as you reap yeah. what you sow, as you reap this this reality that you voted for, right? Mm. Um, and and I really do think that that can be a, a big theme in what we're seeing now is that God, God, sometimes God's wrath is giving us the reality that we demand, giving us Barabbas yeah. when we demand Barabbas instead of Jesus, right? Right. So again, with the King David thing, the whole idea of kings in the first place was Israel, was ours. It was our idea to have a king, not God's. So then yes. every ordination of king happened after that was fulfillment of that prophecy in 1 Samuel 8. Next, David mm. was ordained to be king as a teenager, and we see all the attributes of a loving shepherd. <laughs> he served yeah. his brothers yeah. on the front lines. He brought food. like yeah. He was a virtuous, humble, wise teenage shepherd, which is why he was chosen, right? Um, right. And this meme that's floating around will often say, uh, what you think God can't ordain? What is it? An adulterous, filthy minded, uh, wealthy man to, right. to do God's will. It's like, well, King David wasn't even ordained when he was that way. Right. It, that's right. The Kings in the scriptures. And I think we miss this so often with figures like Samson and, and others, they are anti-heroes. <laughs> There are some right, incredible right. things that God does in trying to bring yeah. them back to the covenant and and yeah. and but they are anti-heroes. The the prophets, the Nathan who comes up to David and says, "Look at how you're misusing yeah. power. <laughs> you have right. literally right. taken something that's akin to murdering a lamb and slaughtering it. What yeah. you have done to Bathsheba, yeah. that is what you have done. Mm. How could you ever repay that?" Mm. Right? Nathan was risking his own life by saying that to the kings. Right. How many prophets l- like live after saying that in Israel's history? Not many. So, yes, David listened. But again, David's repentant heart. Yeah. If you read Psalm 51, Lord, blot mm. out my transgressions. Can you imagine the current presidential elect saying that? Right. Right? So like even filthy minded, yeah. adulterous, wealthy David was at least in that moment willing to be repentant and write it down for a whole yes. of Israel to see. But in an interview, we, we have heard that there's not even a willingness to bring God into the equation of forgiveness of sins for the, the current president. Yeah. Like. So that, that comparison just continues to, to fall apart when you look at the actual narrative in scripture. And and so I I think that where I've arrived with that is this ongoing justification from so many Christians Mm. to say, God has placed the people in, in the thrones above us. So you can't question that. Right. And we use that narrative to silence the Nathans among us who dare to speak truth to power. So you are silencing Mm. the voice of the prophets now to elevate your king. And like that, what if you can't see that that same narrative led to the reasons why Jesus was crucified, whose, whose harshest Mm. words was Mm. Jesus uh, the target of? It was those who misused their religion as a tool of oppression and 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 personal power over other people right and that's the that's the group that then led to say we got to get rid of this guy because he's too forgiving he's too generous he loves mm. the people we think are outcasts he's including the people that are unclean and messing up this whole hierarchical power that we've established for ourselves that is really lucrative right you can't say bring good news to the poor and not freak out all the rich people who are profiting on the current status quo right right after he said that preached that he they tried to throw him off a ledge he was just quoting isaiah Mm. right yeah and so once you see that narrative of invoking the prophetic voice of holding those on the the earthly thrones accountable to the covenant and heart of God is the very reason 
that the the prophets were killed and and Jesus even says this invoking right. Jeremiah he's weeping over Jerusalem and said how many prophets come to die within your walls and what happens to him he dies within Jerusalem right so embodying mm. again the prophet that spoke truth to the ways in which power is misused and abused by the people over the people that God has sent us to love serve and care for um and so it breaks my heart to consistently see Christians using mm. scripture and even the name of Jesus to say, this is the king. How yeah. dare you question them? <laughs> God is is in the midst of this and won't even have the self-awareness to listen to who might be prophetically speaking truth to power uh, today. Mm. And this is so... This is so great. And I, I'm imagining for a lot of people, it, it's going to be revelatory this sense of the way that scripture not only does not underwrite the kings in this way. So, so I love the simplicity of like, yeah, how many how many books are named after kings? How many are named after prophets? The way that Jesus situates himself yep. in this ongoing dispute between prophets and kings. Yeah. But I really hadn't thought about it the way I, I'd never had this thought in my life before you said that the way you did about David, how it's like. Because, yes, I do think in, in Christian liturgical worship, we remember David especially for his repentance. Mm -hmm. Psalm 51 gets yeah. highlighted a lot. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah, like we're talking about someone who's not repentant. But the, but I, I just it just hit me hilarious in a way to think about the way that – because within David's own story, it ends so dark. So David's dark. telling, you know, his son um, – now I, now, I told these folks, I promised that I'd let them off the hook but now you go kill him, you know, and right. after even on the other side of receiving this mercy. So it's like, right. it's clear that David, Samson, all these figures, Anna, Her Anna Heroes, as you say, cautionary tales. But I just had this hilarious image of it kind of being like, it's if you were talking about Breaking Bad and your assessment of the show is like, man, that Walter White, what a great science <laughs> teacher, right? I mean, like, he's a great chemistry teacher. And like, no, wait a second. This is... yeah. This is not what you're supposed to take away from the story. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think that's <laughs> such a perfect example. Like if you read, nobody reads Absalom, it feels like in church. And we need to read right. the story of Absalom yeah. where uh, David literally condones the same kind of sin against his daughter, his stepdaughter mm -hmm. that was done to Bathsheba. Yeah. So like this horrible yeah. abuse and treatment of women that Absalom leads an insurrection against his own father over because he's right. not picking up the mantle of authority of the same kind of sin that he supposedly repented from in his own life. Mm. So like if, if we don't follow these narratives to the end and, and honestly, my friend, I'd love to hear your perspective on this because one of my deepest laments as a pastor is I have I have studied and have multiple degrees in scripture and church history. Like I have devoted my life to understanding the narrative of the Bible and I'm still trying to get my head wrapped around it. Right. Absolutely. One of my deepest heartbreaks stepping into pastoral ministry is how biblically illiterate so yeah. many people are that that yeah. harshly demand that other people follow it. Like it feels like the loudest right. people who demand a biblical conformity are the ones who really don't understand it, who understand it the least. It feels yeah. like, um, is that something yeah. that you find in your ministry as well? Uh, uh, all the time. And it's, and it's like the sense that these characters and these stories do have a kind of mythic, power mm -hmm. over us and it almost at this point seems like it's the proximity that people get to the truth of them that makes it so dangerous because then just a little turn oh wait a second um maybe the the heroes in the old testament aren't kings they're prophets oh that's my this one little turn that all of a sudden like become and i but i just feel like because it's it's so strange the way people be reading these texts out loud in church yeah. that are in them that just bear in them the hope of so much liberation and transformation yeah. And yet using them in destructive and oppressive yeah. ways, the very text that would that would come to set us free. I mean, it's it for me, it increasingly just underwrites the way that why it is that Jesus spends as much time as he does. Because of course, as a as a devout Jew, as a faithful Jewish person, it's not a critique of Judaism, but why Jesus is always, you know, contrasting th this same kind of yep. toxic driven yep. Appearance driven religion where it matters more how it looks than how it actually is, mm -hmm. which is the temptation in any religious system, yep. any belief system, any yep. ideology that Jesus keeps. 
I wanted to specifically ask you because uh, you, you drove by this uh, a moment ago. Um, the way, though, then people interpret, and I know Romans 13 is one of those texts yeah. that comes up a lot in terms of like, well, the Bible says, yeah. you know, we got to do what, what the authorities tell us to do. What would be for off the top of your head? What are what are some of the the handful of texts that you find are most consistently misused mm. in a way that creates some of these narratives? Like, well, like where people ter- either uh, misinterpret, take out of context. Like, what would be kind of your highlight reel of misused texts, man? Right now, highlight. Let's just do top five because it feels like there's so many. That- top five. <laughs> I'd say just Jesus flipping over the tables is one that is just so, so misused and abused. Like, and my response to that just as yours is like, I've heard from rabbis and my fellow brothers and sisters in Judaism that like Jesus was a faithful Jew bringing reformation (laughs) and where like he went to the center of his place of worship, the temple. So like if we Christians want to apply that correctly, we will go to our churches and flip over the tables of injustice in our churches. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's so misused. And it's, it's a critique on how money and power have fused themselves to religion. Right. And so if we really Mm. want to read it deeply, like, and, and I think the way any text is misused is that instead of using it as a mirror towards ourselves, we use it as right. a weapon against the world, right? So the yes, Bible is supposed yes. to be a mirror for us. Like we are yeah. the ones it is written yeah. to. It's for us to repent yeah. from our sins, right? And even Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 5. He says, what business is it of mine to judge the Gentiles? Are you not supposed yeah. to judge the people inside? That's your job. That's right. <laughs> right. And that's all that's right. throughout the gospel. Like that blew my mind the first time I read it because I'm like, oh, I'm the one who needs to repent. Like, I'm not supposed to use this Bible yes. to thump other people to get them to repent. Like, Jesus is calling his yeah. own people, even when he sends out the disciples. It's to the lost sheep of right. Israel, not to the Gentiles, not to that's the Samaritans. Right. Like, he is sending it to his people. So that's, I think that's what the state of Christianity communicates today, is that we have mm. not told our own people to repent. <laughs> and we ooh, are ooh. reaping that consequence. So flipping over the tables. I and, and if I could just jump in, yeah. cause I, I so love that. It's like, I'm so there and it's so, uh, yeah, the spiritual just doesn't work that way. But the way then that text becomes for people, just like a, a way of saying then, well, look, Jesus gets mad. Therefore, yeah. whatever I'm mad about, whoever I'm mad at, it must be God. Like, wait, 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 what? <laughs> what? <laughs> right. like the, this is the text that justifies all of my rage and scapegoating right. towards any human being that like, crosses my path, like it's just, just wild. Right. It's just, mm. just wild. And yet any person who critiques capitalism of our day or the, the fusion right. of church and state, like they are the, the heretics when that's more in line with sure. what Jesus was actually doing in flipping over the tables yeah. in his own time. Right. So that one yeah. and close along with uh, that, I'd say is I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. Um, that one again is used to justify that malicious behavior and and those sorts of things when really Jesus is using that. It's a metaphor, right? It's not an actual sword because it's, this is the same guy who told Peter and rebuked him to put his sword away. (laughs) Those who live by the sword, died by the sword. That was an actual sword. That was an (laughs) actual sword. Jesus is not holding an actual sword. When he says this, he's talking Mm. about the ways in which when people when people have fused the words of God with an inappropriate yeah. definition of power, that is going to be really alarming to people. And it's going to cause mm. division, even in households that says, no, wait, I'm supposed to be nonviolent in a violent world. Mm. That's going to cause division. I'm supposed to be generous when I feel like yeah. people are taking things from me. That's going to cause division. So that's the sword that, he has not come mm. to bring peace again. If you read that whole, it comes to right. reading it in context. Read the whole chapter of that. It is after Jesus sends the disciples to his own people, the lost sheep of Israel. So the mm. the, the sword he's come to bring is among his own people, right? To, yeah. to not to bring peace, to not to maintain the status quo is what he's saying. I have right. come to dismantle these things so that we will embody again the heart of God in the world. Um, Mm. Gosh, the Romans 13, I mean, and Peter says, subject themselves to the governing authorities. 
man, like mm. if you just look at how that those passages have been so misused in history, like yeah. the slaveholders used Romans 13, Nazis, those who supported apartheid. And these are Christians using Romans 13 to justify that. The most recent one was Jeff Sessions in 2018 using Romans 13 yeah. to justify separating kids, immigrant kids from their mom and dad, like just ho horrible atrocities done in the name of that, those passages. And when in reality, Romans 12 and the rest of Romans 13, Paul is intentionally sandwiching the order of God's order because God is not a God of chaos, right? So all of the sure. authorities that we see in the world today, God is trying to function through and establish these things to bring about what? Like, mostly, mm -hmm. most of the times Romans 13 is just read as saying, oh, look, there's the power structures we have to obey. When Paul doesn't even use the Greek word for obey, He's respect, mm -hmm. <laughs> respect, yeah. Yeah. obey. He uses in other parts of the letter to the Romans. So it's not the same word of just blind obedience, right? It is respect yeah. the authorities in place for God has established them because Paul's the same guy who gets arrested multiple times and beheaded by the governing authority, right? right. So he's either right. a hypocrite or he's meaning something different. Yeah. And so Romans 13. And a lot of these words we're reading. Right. Yeah, it's from, that he's written from that he's written while in, in prison. prison. That's the, that's right. Really it's like, God. come on. <laughs> it's not that hard to just read the whole book. Like you can read and yeah. watch Netflix as yeah. long as you want to. Just read the book that you're quoting <laughs> online right now. Like, don't leave it up yes. to just people yes. like us. Read the book. But like Paul, yeah. Paul is saying it's sandwiching between this is what it means to love your neighbor. Do not persecute yeah. you. Pray for those who persecute you. Live at peace with all yeah. in all the ways that you can feed your enemy. If he's hungry, love them and then be subject yes. to the governing authorities over you. And he's talking about taxes. Mm -hmm. Like pay your taxes, right. like be a good citizen. And then he sandwiches mm -hmm. it again. Love your neighbor. The, Romans 13, 8, after he's talking about the ordered, ordered way of reality, he, he again sandwiches it with love your neighbor. So the ways in which he was arrested and persecuted was because the governing authorities got in the way of loving his neighbor well. And that's yes. why. It wasn't mm. because he was disrupting or causing chaos. It's because he wanted to love his neighbor in ways that the governing authorities yeah. wasn't allowing him. So he was even holding the governing authorities accountable to loving the, our neighbors well. And like when we miss that, so we will justify the worst atrocities to people we don't like saying, well, God right. has established the governing authorities. They just need to follow along and, without asking questions. That is a privileged perspective to take when you are yes, when is. you are drowning out the people that the governing authorities are using their power to oppress and persecute. So good, and that's it. Was that, that, that I'm loving this list. Was that three? I think we got three. I thought that was five all because I was counting the Peter. Oh, was it a five, yeah. Oh, counting yeah. that as one. Yeah, no, that's oh, right. So it is. Oh, oh, oh here's yeah. another one. Those who shall not, uh, those who do not work shall not eat. <laughs> oh, from First Thessalonians. Speak to it, please. <sighs> it's just so bad. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. What, what's the quickest way that you can tell me that your theological hermeneutic is American libertarianism and capitalism? Then when you use that mm -hmm. verse in that way, one. Paul is in the first century context where the stratification between the wealthy and the poor is dr more mm. dramatic than we can even comprehend in America today, right? Sure. And who has the luxury to choose between eating and working? Mm. The wealthy. Right, right. If you don't work at all as a poor person in the first century, you die, right? So yeah. to, to be able to say, you know what? I'm still going to eat today. I'm still going to be the busybody that Paul is talking about not being in that passage. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go around my own business, get put my nose in everyone else's business. And I'm going to do that instead right. of working to provide for myself and the rest of the community as well. But I'm still going to eat. That's a very wealthy, mm -hmm. privileged position to take, right? So Paul yes. is critiquing those wealthy busybodies who are putting their nose in everyone else's business, trying to control everybody else. 
and then still thinks yeah. that they can eat and take from the communal coffers to provide from themselves, right? Mm -hmm. When you use mm -hmm. that as a way of condemning the poor or those who literally just have to use welfare, do you know the average time that a poor person in the United States spends on welfare? It is two and a half mm. years. Two and wow. a half years is the average time that somebody spends on welfare. Mm -hmm. So like if you use mm -hmm. that as a way to uphold your status quo of capitalism or rugged individualism and shame the poor, you are using yeah. that passage in the wrong way, right? Again, this is for our repentance. <laughs> it's not That's to right. make everyone else abide by what we think the Bible should should say and do. Yeah. Even, you know, when you use the phrase, man, uh, it's all so good, shaming the poor. That's one. That's part of what's been so grievous for me. And I think what first kind of pushed me out to talk about some of these exact realities, more going back to like 2016, uh, a little before then maybe, but like the sense that, Okay, it's one I, I get where there can be ideological difference as to how we care to the poor, as to how we care for refugees. Yeah. But it sure seems like that for people of faith, it should not be in question whether or not we get to demonize the poor oh and gosh. demonize refugees. Right. Like this, this should seems like this should be outright. But it feels like right now, it, and I don't think I'm exaggerating here. It actually feels like demonizing, shaming, scapegoating the poor and immigrants is kind of the animating energy of the entire thing. Yeah. Is that feel no, fair to say? I, I think that is not an oversimplification at all. It is dehumanizing the other. It is the us versus yeah. them rhetoric, right? And and that is what is animating so much of Christianity in the United States right now, that there's so much mm. fear between towards them. And we have come up with yeah. all this lingo to describe them. And we may not even know anyone in that so-called group that we are demonizing, right? right. I was looking back mm. on some of the theological statements done uh, just towards immigrants recently, um, when before, you know, Im immigrants became this um, people group that we were really demonizing and standing ag against, right? And the Southern Baptist mm. Convention in their publication, and I think this was 1997, right? So not a, mm. not a long time ago, they unequivocally said, we do not reduce a person's humanity to their legal status. Wow. We are going to love the stranger among us because that is mm -hmm. what the Bible calls us to do. Like, like you talk about mm. biblical integrity, right? Like that yeah. is their, their denominational stance in 1997. And we have, we have mm. immigration issues all throughout the history of our country. Right. But sure. I live in Idaho where there is a Japanese internment camp that I have been to and see mm. the bars, right. Of uh, some of the largest mm. population of Japanese Americans after Pearl Harbor was bombed, they rounded up people without with just vague perspectives of who was legal and illegal and just rounded them up in camps like that. You, you think of Sulu from Star Trek, one of my favorite TV shows. Like he was mm -hmm. among the Japanese American that was in that camp. Right. And this was yeah. FDR. Right. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, get, we can't get on our high horse thinking it's one political party or the other that's susceptible to it in, in our American experience. Right. We have all been guilty of, of xenophobia against the people we don't understand. Right. Um, yeah. And who don't look like us, who don't talk like us, who don't believe the same things like us. Like it comes down to the us versus them uh, perspective. And so you can't, yeah. you can't claim to follow Jesus. Whose greatest commandment was love God and love your neighbor as yourself. That's right. And insistently say horrible re demonizing rhetoric about your neighbor. And that's, that's the other mm. thing too. Like one of the more grievous ways that that, that command from Jesus has been misdefined is that even disregarding the parable of the good Samaritan, I have heard Christians with huge platforms say that neighbor means your fellow Christian. Right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And like that is narrowing Oof. it. Well, okay. So your fellow Christian, does that mean your fellow dark skin Christian then? Yeah. Who happens like. Let's talk about black Christians who predominantly vote Democrat. D are, does that include them then too? 
Mm. Or are you thinking of a particular mm. melanin when you're talking about your fellow Christian that you're supposed to love? No, Jesus used a Samaritan, yeah. an outsider as the yeah. hero of his parable to make the point when yeah. the Levite and the priest walked by the other side, the heroes of Israel walked by the other side and did nothing. Jesus used a Samaritan mm. to say who was a good neighbor to the person beaten and left for dead. Yeah. It was the Samaritan yeah. who showed compassion, right? And that is the mm. way in which we are called to love our neighbors. So when you are demonizing other yeah. human beings, who our entire Bible starts off by saying they are created in God's image, and you are completely yeah. obfuscating the image of God in yeah. that person, then you cannot claim mm. to follow Jesus and continue to do that because you are not loving your neighbor as yourself. You would not tolerate that if somebody right. said the same exact stuff about you or your children or your loved ones. Then why are you tolerating it when yeah. it comes out of your mouth about other people? Yeah. And you want to make a whole yeah. political movement about that too? And you expect us to not mm -hmm. stand up against that? Yeah. Like this is – yeah. This is what makes me feel like I'm losing my mind when it's like, this is the heart, yeah, me too. heart of the gospel here. And you are yeah, using it right. to justify the opposite of the gospel. That's, that's that right. to me, that's will, right. I, that will never make sense to me. It's just about no, power no. and control and hate. It, it really does make me feel like I'm losing my mind most of the time. Cause it's like, and the same thing you said in terms of historically, who does this? Of course, the role like shifts. And if uh, if folks on the other side of the aisle were doing that, I'd call that out yeah. too. People would say, "Would you say?" Of course, I would say that. I, the last this has nothing in the world to do with the Democratic Party or like whatever right. else. But it's just when you have a whole movement that feels like at this point, again, the not the the periphery but the center of it is suspicion of your neighbor. Like right. I don't know how to not kind of yell and scream about that a little. Exactly. Um, what do you? What do you think about? I know this kind of opens up a whole another can of worms. Maybe and we uh, and I want to honor your time, but I would love to hear you speak too. Because again, I said this, Ben, you're doing everything I want you to do. Like the way that you specifically attack text and bridge context, I feel like this is the mm -hmm. pastoral theological work yeah. that we desperately need in this in this moment. I would love for you to speak to the way that eschatology plays mm -hmm. into this because. And I think, and by the way, I co completely co-sign your list of like top five. I can't think of texts. I feel like I've been misused more somewhere in the ether, but I don't know quite where to put it. I mean, because I, I think about even, I don't know, years ago, Mark Driscoll's infamous riff on Jesus in Revelation. And it's like he literally envisions, Ugh. you know, Jesus in Revelation 19 as if he's a UFC fighter or something. <laughs> but when, but certain views of eschatology, when people assume that the Jesus who's returning has basically nothing narratively in common right. with the Jesus that we read right. about in the gospels. Exactly. Like where, where does, where does eschatology fit into this whole, this whole theological so scheme? So important. And I'm so glad you brought that up because that's Romans, uh, Romans, uh, Revelation 19 is a, a, a good place to look at a text that is so misused and warped to justify a violent Jesus. Like it's not just, yeah. he's not just flipping tables over anymore. He is slaughtering yeah. armies of them. Right. If you're reading it that way, mm. he is slaughtering the evil, sinful masses. Right. When the whole beginning of Revelation is written to who? Seven right. secular institutions? No, mm. it's written to the churches. It's a pastoral letter, right. right? The whole yeah. stinking letter is about discipleship and faithfulness to Jesus in the midst of being persecuted. Right. And so. Yeah. There's there's so much to say about the book of Revelation because it's so it's so beautiful, but there's it is so complicated right. to read, right? Which is why it gets Absolutely. so misused and stuff like that. But you look at Revelation 19, and there's so many intentionalities behind the author. Jesus shows up riding mm -hmm. on a white horse, and his robe is already dripping with blood. Why? Yes. He hasn't even yes. started the battle yet. So mm -hmm. whose blood is that? Do you know that every ancient mm. Christian would think that is the blood of the crucified lamb that has come? Yeah. It's his blood, not the blood of his enemies, right? Yeah. Um, sorry. Once you get that text, it is so powerful. Um, yeah. This is the crucified lamb that we've just learned about. And John is elevated to the, mm. the highest level of, of heaven. And he hears a lion. He hears the roar of the lion of Judah. 
with the power, the ravenous power to destroy his enemies, to rip them limb from limb. Mm. And he turns around and he sees a lamb. He sees the crucified lamb. He doesn't see a lion. The lamb that opened yeah. the seal with his own life, his own blood. And that is yeah. the witness that John is calling the church to embody in a world that would mm. martyr them and take their own life, that they have the hope of the resurrection because of the witness of the lamb who would rather die for his enemies than kill them. Yeah. And Jesus is using, exhausting the violent power of the empire on himself and saying, that wasn't even enough to stop my divine life. The resurrection from the dead says, violence will never accomplish what you think it will. I love yeah. will have the last word. And so Jesus is riding on this, this white stallion with his robes dripping with blood and he opens his mouth and there are legions mm -hmm. of armed to the teeth, angel armies standing behind him. And this is the quote mm -hmm. battle of Armageddon, right? But you yeah. read it through, through the actual text of the Greek, the angels do nothing. Mm -hmm. They stand there yeah. and like, that's the cataclysmic yeah. part of that. They are there ready for battle. Mm -hmm. And the leader of angel armies does not give the command to go. Nothing happens. There is no battle. Instead, yeah. Jesus conquers sin and death through all of time and history. The same mm -hmm. way God creates, which is a word that is sharper yeah. than any double-edged yeah. sword, right? We get caught up on, oh, it's a sword again, blah, blah, blah. It's like, it is yeah, a right. fragile God who needs weapons and armies. That's right. It is a powerful Ooh, God that. who creates and dismantles with a word, with a word. Yeah. And so Jesus yeah. is liberating all of creation and humanity, the animal kingdom, the poor, the oppressed, the persecuted mm. through a word. That was only mm. accomplished through his life, death, and resurrection through the cross. And that is the, the, the picture, the powerful, profound picture we see in Revelation 19. Mm. He is not coming to use violence. Why would you die a compassionate, nonviolent yeah. death on the cross and then come back and say, that's it. All bets are off. <laughs> yeah. No, he uses the same way that God created to dismantle through all of time and history, right? And then ushers in the new mm. Jerusalem on earth where love reigns mm. supreme, peace reigns supreme, abundance reigns supreme. It is the Garden of Eden reclaimed for all of creation, mm. right? So when we, mm. when we misinterpret that part and read in Left Behind and all these other narratives that justify theocratic theological mm. violence, like we, mm. we have to question ourselves when the Jesus of Revelation looks so much different than the Jesus of the Gospels, right? Man. The Revelation is describing the gospel on steroids, like turning up That's all right. of That's the political right. cartoons, all of the volume. To, yeah. Like yeah. the seven headed dragon, that's the seven mountains of Rome. Like one was had right. the had the assassination attempt against Nero Caesar and the, had the had mm. the wound in the head that looked now dead. Like if you understand the context again, John is talking yes. about yes. current political events in Rome. Yeah rather than talking about some future events that we are going to experience. Mm. Right. And so mm. just, it, it just takes some time to acquaint yourself with the actual text mm. rather than what all these other people have told you about the text That's right. um, that makes these That's things right. become so utterly profound. Like, and to give people grace, John Calvin and, sure. and Luther they both wanted to delete revelation from the canon. They wanted to delete yeah. revelation, yeah. James, the book of Hebrews, because they, yeah. they thought it was counterproductive to the Christian witness. Right. But it, so it's like, right. I understand misunderstanding it and just thinking these books shouldn't be in sure. the Bible to begin with. Sure. But when you understand the intention of why they were written, <laughs> why they are there, then the profundity, it, it never stops. Mm -hmm. Like the re part of yeah. the reason I'm still following Jesus today is because of how deeply yeah. I love the Bible and what, what it has taught. Yes. Me, right. Um, so the, I, I could keep going and going, but like, I, I, I hopefully I've answered the question of the eschatological mm -hmm. piece there that the, the whole intention, like the name of the book yeah. is Apocalypto. The, the Greek word we get yeah. apocalypse from, it is new creation being revealed through Jesus. So it's called mm -hmm. Revelation. What's mm -hmm. being revealed? 
Jesus Christ. That's that's what that's we're right. supposed to think that's when we right. read the whole book. And so new creation, mm. redemption, healing, wiping away tears. Like so that's the crescendo of the book of Revelation. Mm. And that's what we're looking for. That's the goal of the entire book. Mm. And it is talking about all of the cosmos uh, history with humanity being ultimately yeah. healed and redeemed in Christ Jesus, right? So mm. when we when we miss that, we just we miss the mm. whole heart of how it's calling us to be faithful to Jesus, even in the midst of the mm. scariest, most turbulent circumstances. One last mm. one last thing with that, because Please. of the letter that was written to early Christians like that, uh, Nero Caesar um, was one of the most brutal dictators over Christians in in that time. Right, Rome, the, that horrible fire that like burned half of Rome down. He literally yeah. blamed it on Christians. Um, that mm. was the conspiracy theory of the time that Christians were to blame for the falling apart of Rome for, um, you know, I right. mean, you talk about demonizing rhetoric. He was literally lighting Christians on fire to mm. light his garden parties. Like he was a horrible dictator mm. against Christians as Rome was burning to the ground and Caesar had, um, he had either escaped or was just not in the picture at the time, right? Um, as Rome was burning to the ground, early Christians marched into Rome to help the sick and the marginalized mm. and, and died from the fire themselves that they themselves were being blamed for because they refused mm. to allow a hot-headed dictator to stop them from loving their neighbor. And like, yeah. you wonder why Christianity exploded the first three centuries before Constantine made it wow. the official religion. That is why, because they loved yeah. their neighbor in such radical ways that they gave their life for yeah. people they didn't even know out of mm. the sake of hospitality and generosity and inclusion. Like that is why yeah. <laughs> Christianity exploded in yeah. such unlikely place like Rome that was so hostile to it. And so like, that's the power that the book of revelation mm. can have mm. in a time where per Christians were really being persecuted by the empire. But now mm -hmm. we Christians in America, especially those who look like you and I, we need to right. read the new Testament. Like we are the Romans. Not that's right. Not the wow. oppressed Jews of of Rome. Yeah. We have more in common with Rome uh, than when, with the oppressed Christians in 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 Rome. Man, that, I can't tell how much that feeds my soul. I mean, just seeing Revelation as the yeah, this is the this is a panoramic aerial view of the same story the Gospels tell us, the same story the Epistles are telling us. And I got I got weepy too, as you're sure, because every time I think about it, really, because it's like when you really understand and and not, it's not understand like intellectually but when you grasp that these images over and over again are just telling us that god has defeated the forces of death hell yeah. and the grave through his own sacrifice yeah. that's what revelation dramatizes at every it's turn the gospel and over and over and over yes again. yes yes but the idea that then that gets turned into a justification again for all kinds of war and even needing war yeah. and needing people to suffer to accomplish some kind of scheme um, well, how I, I know we're at the, well, how, yeah, please. how audacious is it to say my Jesus died on a cross for me. So I'm going to use his name now to put you up on crosses for disobeying him. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. How, mm. how, how, how have we not learned 1500 years of church history where we have done that right. in inquisition, slavery, genocide against mm. native peoples? Like, how have we not mm. learned that lesson that we are called to yeah. take up our own crosses in the name of Jesus, not yes. put other people yes. on them for, for mm. disobeying who we think Jesus should be. Right. It's, mm. it is, it is the worst form of heresy to claim to follow mm. Jesus and hate other people. I believe it. Yeah. If God is yeah. love, I, then hate and intolerance and cruelty is the heresy. It's not unbelief. It's mm. hate, intolerance, and cruelty towards your neighbor. If God is love, then that's the heresy. Yeah. That is a word. I will sit with that. Goodness, not unbelief that's the heresy, but to make God, uh, gosh, to, to, to turn God into a... a, a a construct that helps us to hate yep. that's just oh 
Any, ben, anything you would say just finally by word of encouragement? Because I know you're hearing from so many people as I am too, who are just so deeply disillusioned and disenchanted because they see these scriptures they love, yeah. maybe even the Jesus they love. And and, and we're, I think we're realistic about the fact that this narrative is not winning. Of course, this is not the majority view of, among people of faith, right. certainly not white evangelical Christians in North yeah. America. So what, for people who are really disillusioned that um, their faith is being used that way and co-opted that way, and there's no signs of it slowing down. Yeah. Well, what would you say to those to those folks? Well, it's really, really hard to not. So you're seeing a whole group of people do us and them rhetoric, right? Mm. It's really hard to not play into us and them in response. <laughs> yeah. The same Christ that I follow that I really want people to know tells me to love my enemy and sure how the and i want to cuss like how the heck am i supposed to do that right now right yeah and one of the ways is really so i'll give you an example i i live in idaho which is like texas 2.0 right we are we are <laughs> in so many ways we embody that we were a, a confederate satellite from the south that had huge numbers of confederate soldiers come and be in in idaho mm. uh, after the civil war and lincoln had to establish fort boise here to suppress the confederate presence which had already just run rap and we live into that kind of identity mm. still today um but the the um before the legislative session last uh Last year, a group of Republicans reached out to me to say, would you come speak to mm. us before the legislative session begins? And I was like, what? Like, I get I get called all sorts of horrible names online by, by people on the mm. right simply for trying sure. to convey the message that I feel like God has called me to. Like, what can you tell me why you would want me to come speak? And they said, we don't know how to talk to our far right Christian colleagues. And we're wondering if you would help give us language to do that. And and so it was the most mm -hmm. eye opening. Like I, I saw in myself that I was throwing all conservatives, all Republicans into yeah. one big vat, right? When these are sitting mm. Republican legislators and they have asked me to come and talk with them, mm. it was so eye opening to me. And so then mm. I've had in, I've had intentional polls and like questions online about like how many conservatives are following my newsletter, how many conservatives are following my, mm. my online work. And there are so many that there are so many wow. that are opposed to this us versus them. Like, and you talk about mm. struggle when it comes to voting. I mean, and there's people with huge platforms like Adam Kitzinger and David French and, mm. and um, Russell Moore. Like these are they are representative sure. of a whole movement of people who would consider themselves conservative and yet are staunchly right. opposed to the gospel being used in us and them ways. Right. Yeah. And so that to me is really a, a double edged sword. One, it, it needs to prevent me from making assumptions that like all Republicans, sure. like, all of them are that way. Right. Or all conservatives are that way. Um, and all progressives are great. Like all, all people on my mm -hmm. side are, have it all together, right? Like you, we have to have this um, even perspective, but it also, um, it also challenges me to not have that us versus them ment mentality in my mind, but also to open up conversations and understand that we have, we have friends and allies in unexpected places, right? That's we right. just went through something so hope shattering like let's be honest about it <laughs> for the future for so many ways um but that doesn't mean that all of the good people that have been opposed to such things just disappear right um yeah. it's just really unfortunate that that's what the conclusion that we got right is where we're at mm. right right now um and so just to encourage you to <laughs> as as difficult as it may be allow yourself to grieve Give yourself all the time that yeah. you need, um, but don't let your hope die <laughs> and continue to reach out to the community that you know is there, that you know loves you. Yeah. And I know I've already gotten hundreds of messages from people talking about how they feel like they can't go back to church because of the sermons that were given right before election and the sermons sure. given right after, right? And my heart breaks for that. Um, and so mm. I'm, I'm, I know that I try to do this, but other people online try to do this as, as well, where we're trying to create an online space for people in between church yeah. communities right now. 
So my, that's right. my goal right now is to do weekly sermons. Like, I feel like that's all the time that I can mm. commit to, but if you want a sermon, I'm going to put it on a podcast every week and we're just going to mm. walk through scripture together um, so that you have at least a, a sermon that makes you feel connected yeah. uh, to your, to your worship. Right. Cause we have so many people in between communities right now. Um, but to just hold on and find community where you, where you can, it may not look mm -hmm. like church, <laughs> But sure. the body of Christ met in the catacombs, like the, the body of Christ was the marginalized and met in people's homes and Eucharist was a meal that they actually shared with other people who were hungry. So it's like it, maybe reading the early church can give you some inspiration of what gathering together can look like in a time. Yeah. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. It is. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. I can't thank you enough for that. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your witness. Thank you for making people feel less alone and less crazy and helping to create this kind of space for people who feel like they don't have a space or feel in between spaces. I just can't think of what is a more needed Christian witness in this moment than uh than what you're doing. So I'm 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 so grateful. And I do hope people will find uh, we'll listen to the podcast, the, follow the newsletter, like all of it, because uh, I do. I, I know this is stuff that really is keeping people alive right now. So thank you, thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's mass chaos for sure. It really it was a couple of weeks. It, no, about a month before the election that I started doing like daily, which seems like, how can I do that? I basically have three jobs as it is. So what am I? But I felt this weird, what felt like a nudge of the spirit to do it, not understanding where now it's like, not in a way that makes sense of things, but like, oh, oh. <laughs> so maybe, the, but the, the, the more that I just connect with people who feel like I don't have any sources right now who are keeping me sane or helping me find a sense of community and feel like, yeah, it just seems like, a thing that we're supposed to be doing. So I'm glad we're in this together. And uh, thank you so much for this conversation today. I, I, my own soul need it. This is water in a, in, in a thirsty time. So thank you so much, my friend. Same to you.